You're listening to Dots, Lines, and Destinations, a travel podcast with host Stephen Seagraves, Fosma Moon, and Seth Miller. Hello, and welcome to episode 482 of Dots, Lines, and Destinations. I'm Stephen Seagraves, joined this week by Seth Miller and shortly Fosma Moon. Um, how you doing, Seth? I'm doing okay. How are yeah, you? I'm doing all right. Yeah, it's finally stopped raining here, so that's good. It's been a week of oh, rain. Exciting. Yes, yes. <laughs> it's just been nonstop. Um, we got a lot to talk about, so we should just get started. Um, Aer Lingus has confirmed that it won't be the launch customer for the new XLR jet from Airbus. This is interesting because we, we kind of thought they would be, right? Right. And so what's it, super interesting to me about this, IAG, the parent company, still is. Um, and it had always in, initially intended that these planes would go to Aer Lingus, at least the first ones, because Aer Lingus wants to have a few longer, uh, routes with smaller planes into North America. I think uh, Minneapolis was probably supposed to be the first, and it was going to be, they do, they're putting a 330 in there this summer, high capacity, yep. more demand. Uh, but to keep winter operations, they were going to try to do the XLR. And now they're not going to have it. So That's... obviously, it's, you know, the theory is that at some point they will get things started. The, the reason they, can't, they aren't getting it is a uh, pilot pay dispute. So, so they're not going to take it because of this pilot pay dispute. I think, well, again, IAG is going to take it, but, but they're not going to sort of last minute details on like how it gets painted and what the interior looks like. They had to make some decisions with Airbus, mm. uh, I guess, two weeks ago now, relatively recently. It's in details are in this late story, but um, they had to you know give Airbus the final details and management was waiting to get confirmation from the pilots union that they had an agreement on how they were going to staff and fly and who was getting paid how much etc and they did not reach that agreement and so now they're saying airbus won't get the first one but they're not saying who will it's kind and of like i would think that whoever else is going to get it would already have to have similar agreements with its pilots so i don't know that part's a little weird i mean i don't think ba would want them right no i think uh iberia mm. Uh, or Welling were on the list. I can't remember. Gotcha. But anyway, v- Welling would they want to fly them long, f- like over the transatlantic? I would assume more towards the Middle East and Africa. Oh, but gotcha. yeah, yeah, okay. Well, how, what the hell do I know? Um, Stranger yeah. things have happened. Indeed, indeed. Yeah, we talk about that from time to time on our podcast. Yeah, you should listen. <laughs> um, <laughs> in other airplane news, uh, Lufthansa is saying the triple seven X. They probably won't get until 2026. Surprise. Yeah, they're now not expecting to put it into their schedule until the 2026 summer season. So, I, which would I think that's even aggressive, day. right? Yeah. Um, right. At the end of the day, like Boeing still does not have authorization from the FAA to begin testing for certification. Yep. And the FAA's, for better or worse, in control at this point. I think probably for better, for generally speaking, but until. There's a plan for what a certification test program looks like and how it's going to work. Boeing is sort of, I guess, still building them, but they can't deliver them. They can't do anything with them. Yeah, I mean, I see them doing test flights every now and then, but that's really it. Yeah, but what's interesting about those is like those test flights, I think, don't count. Oh, really? Maybe they do. Maybe the hours can be added retroactively, but like an, until you know what the plan is, what are yeah. you testing for? Yeah. And maybe they've done sort of the same as we've always done for every other plane and just hope that Boeing will, or as you hope that the FAA will let the same thing come through. But yeah, I don't know. Hmm. Yeah, it's, that's an interesting point. Because I mean, you see it, I do, I see it doing some like long haul stuff. So it'll go like, it'll go out to Moses Lake and then it will start from Moses Lake and do like a huge loop around kind of the Pacific side of the country. Uh, maybe land in Portland and then it'll go and do another loop. So I don't know if they're doing like, you know, longer duration tests. But yeah, it's kind of weird to see it. Um, yeah, strange. Yeah, I, sh- I guess I should put my alerts back on for it. I hadn't been paying too much attention to it. I figured they just were hanging out. Yeah, I'm trying to remember the last one I saw was maybe a couple weeks ago. Yeah. Uh, okay. yeah, and they sometimes bring it down here to Portland and park it. Like they land, they hang out for a few hours, and then they go do something else. So I don't know. Black um, the terminal. Yeah, like they. I, I don't know. I mean, we don't. I, the terminal here is not big enough. I don't think. But um, I don't know what they're doing. Yeah. Uh, Tampa, Amsterdam, coming back on Delta in October. What? Yeah. They flew this in October 2019. So, you know, there's some history there. Uh, the argument here, I guess, is transatlantic demand is back, baby. 
but it's it's weird that it's like this weird shoulder season for it. Well, what I can't tell, summer. I think, it's not summer. I think it's they filed it to start in the uh, full on winter IATA season. Um, I guess it'd be interesting to see if they're giving up a slot or if they're borrowing one from KLM or something because Amsterdam is capacity. Yeah. Um, but I believe it's not a shoulder. I believe it's a, a filed for the full winter season. So do you think it's like people going to Tampa, like snowbirds from Europe going to Tampa? Yes. I guess it kind of makes, kind of makes sense. Yeah. And not just Tampa, right? You get, you're relatively close to the whole Gulf Coast, Southwest Florida, Fort Myers, Sanibel Island. Yeah, true. Yeah. That whole side of everything. I mean, I'm, it's interesting to me that they don't, that they, uh, that there's enough traffic to justify a nonstop rather than just connecting the traffic through Atlanta. Like that's, that's super interesting to me. Yeah, and the, the other thing, and I'm trying to pull it up now um, for details. I don't think it's daily. Oh, okay. That no, could it, be is. Cool. it is. Oh, it is. Oh, that's, a, that's a lot. Yeah. That's a lot yeah. of people. Yep, and all the way through the winter season. Oh, wild. Um, and then Delta also flew a charter, uh, three A330, to Toulouse to take delivery of the Team USA A350. Yeah, this was just a cute little thing. That, so they've got the, they are the official sponsor of Team USA and have been, I guess, United has done it for some time. I think Delta took it over a few years ago. Yeah. Um, and so Delta painted a plane, Team USA, whatever, and it's a new delivery A350, which if I'm doing the math should also be the ones with the bigger business class cabin and the other things that lets them do South Africa flights. So um, good news, bad news on that. If I'm right on that, it would seem that that plane is going to spend more time going to South Africa than not. So rather than sort of routing all over the network, which would be interesting. But anyway. yeah, um, yeah, they they brought a whole bunch of people over for a celebration in the delivery flight, which, you know, is just a thing to do, but I, they operated a charter flight to bring them all there. So it's just a kind of a funny logistics of how you move things around, but you know, you're an airline and you've got airplanes. So it's what you can do. Yeah. I mean, I guess it's nice if you're, if you're one of the people who got to go. I think it was like a bunch of chairman's club, which is uh, if I remember correctly, it's the internal employee recognition program. Oh, okay. Nice. Yeah. Very nice. I think is what it was. It was something like that. I don't know. Yeah. Uh, Bonza, which I didn't know was a really a thing, um, but I guess it is a thing. It's an airline it in, in the Australia, Oceania area yeah. uh, is no longer a thing. Yes, uh, was a thing. Uh, so this was a startup ultra low cost carrier we'll go with, um, although I think those terms are basically all bullshit anyways these days. Uh, they had quickly expanded and had a pretty impressive network along the east coast of Australia. Um some point, a lot of point to point stuff, uh, some big city stuff too. Uh, they were one of the many, uh, 777 group airlines. So the other one of note these days is Flair yep. in Canada. Yep. And, uh, with very little notice, Bonza ran out of money and temporarily, quote unquote, temporarily suspended operations. And as we have seen many times before, those temporary suspensions almost always become permanent. Uh, generally speaking, the problem was they weren't paying for the airplanes, and so the lessors repossess them. Uh, hmm. It has since come to light that apparently 777 Group was supposed to be paying, or 777 Partners, whatever, was supposed to be paying the lease money and wasn't paying it. Hmm. So that's awkward. Yeah. Um, and uh, they also were, uh, like, at the same time, 777, the 777 parent company was sending money to other investments and endeavors uh, specifically around trying to buy a football team in Europe. Yeah, a, they, they, guys, there's a lot of questionable actions going on there. Um, and keep in mind, historically, right, like Flair has also had issues with lease costs and payments and such over in recent, you know, within the past year. And so. So so what I mean, they, they've been charged with fraud or they've been accused of fraud. Right. <laughs> oh, so yeah. Then separate from that. Not the whole not paying for the airplanes thing and not telling anybody apparently at Bonza. Uh, they also, uh, and maybe it is actually separate. Maybe it comes up because the lessors are you know bringing the planes back and like looking at the assets. Uh, there has also been a claim filed that uh, the group basically double committed or or committed assets that didn't exist to the tune of three hundred fifty million dollars for loans and other debts. So right, like. We talk about with airlines, especially unencumbered assets, when it's time to borrow money to buy airplanes or to not go bankrupt during COVID or whatever it is. Yeah, yeah. And you pledge, you know, 
here is my plane. If I stop paying my loan, you can have it. Here is my spare parts and engines. Here's my loyalty program. Here's my branding. There's here are the slots I have at congested airports. That all of these things are assets that can be um, pledged for loans, and there's many more in the industry. Um, and so apparently, they as a group, and this, these guys aren't just an airline. They have all these other assets that they invest in and whatever. But they apparently committed fraud over to the tune of like three hundred fifty million dollars. Yeah, great. I mean, it's they're, 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 they're basically like private equity, right? When yeah. it comes to and yeah, Get very it. much so. Love it, love it. Um, let's talk about let's talk about global. Your favorite topic? Yeah, uh, they flew there. They have an A three eighty, and they flew it to Europe. They made it all the way to uh, Prestwick in Glasgow. It just stopped. It started in Vegas, right? Uh, Pinal. Uh, oh, okay. No, Mojave. Mojave. Okay, Mojave. Uh, and then flew. Did it fly to Montreal? Mirabel. And then Mirabel flew over the Atlantic. Yes. Uh, one might think that with four engines and you know the ability to fly eighteen hours, it could probably just have gone the whole way. Yeah. Turns out not so much. Uh, the plane made both flights a total of about 10 or 11 hours in the air with its landing gear down mm-hmm. and flew, flew at a max altitude of about twenty six or 27,000 feet. Uh, it turns out that, and this is a thing with A380s, after they have been stored, uh, you have to do a gear swing test. Okay. So basically you put it up on a jack, you retract the gear, and then you release the hydraulics and make sure the gear swings down and locks into place on its own. Yep. Um, because obviously it's very dangerous if you go to do, you know, a flight and the wheels go up and then they don't come back down and you can't get them back down just by gravity. Just Let's, let, let me just take a guess. Let me just take a guess. They didn't want to do the test or couldn't do the test in Mojave for whatever reason. They could not do the test because they did not have the necessary jacks. And so they're like, well, we got to get the plane to Europe. So we're just going to fly it with the gear down because then we don't have to worry about them coming back down. Correct. Um now, someone has pointed out to me since that uh, apparently Lufthansa did something similar with its planes, uh, with its 380s coming out of the Truel, the Spanish yeah. uh, boneyard where they were parked. So it's not completely unprecedented that a plane would make the trip back to a main maintenance base without having done this gear swing test first because, you know, my, my initial thought was, did no one ever expect these planes to fly again? Yeah. Right? Like, if you don't have the hardware available to get them out of maintenance when you park them somewhere, you must be assuming that they're going to become beer cans, but what do I know? Uh, but apparently it's not entirely unheard of. It is, a, we were trying to, I was talking with some folks trying to figure out the last time an airplane made a known gear down transatlantic crossing and it has certainly been a while. Wow. Like, with no US operators of the A380 and no major maintenance bases in North America, there wasn't a lot of options there. Uh, and Presswick is an interesting place for this uh, is there a large you know of a maintenance base there well so that's another very interesting thing that uh they shared in the um i'm gonna see if i can pull it up here real quick uh because i asked about that and i was trying to get the quote right they basically in their release uh, uh, uh in the release uh they mentioned that it was basically they're working to set up the like, maintenance there. I got the document here. Sorry, it took me a little longer there. Blah, 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 blah. It's somewhere in here. Uh, here we go. Uh, quote from James Asquith, CEO of Federal Global Airlines. Quote, looking ahead, everybody in the team. Oh, no, sorry. Uh, no, that's the wrong quote. Dang it. I'm sorry. I, I swear it's in here somewhere. Um. They are expecting it to stay in, at Presswick for a while to do maintenance. It's unclear who. Hmm. So they kind of are setting up a base there. What? Uh, or a maintenance facility there. It, maybe? Yeah. Um. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah, it's very weird. I swear there's something in here about setting something up at Presswick. Um, uh, no, here we go. From Presswick, the next steps for 9H Global will be for Global's partners to start work on the complete interior refurbishment and to develop a new maintenance capabilities at the airport, which will enable the aircraft to take the next steps towards launching passenger flights. Hmm. Uh, and it says at the airport, I'm assuming it's Presswick, not Malta, which is where everybody assumed the plane was going to go because that's where Highfly did its maintenance on it. I yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, main, or housed it. I'm not sure if they did the maintenance there. But anyway, it's it's unclear if Highfly is going to still do this maintenance work. There's a like like always with these guys, a lot of uh, vague answers to direct questions. But 
Yeah, I mean, do you still? I mean, do you still see it happening? Like, are you are you still thinking it's not going to happen? I mean, that's kind of been your. I I am not. Uh, I'm not convinced that they'll never get off the ground. I they are working. I mean, obviously, the AOC, the certification and uh, operating certificate is a big deal, and proving that they can do that is something that is takes a lot of time and energy. I don't think it'll happen this year. Yeah, um, but. Where they are financially and whatnot, I think they have enough money that they could probably get to the point where they can operate. Yeah. I don't think they'll ever be profitable doing it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I've i kind of, I think I've gone back and forth. Like, I thought, this is no way this is going to happen. But they seem to continue to make strides just really slowly. With Yeah. And, right, like, as long as you're moving forward, that's good news for the business. But at some point, does the money run out? And mm-hmm. you know, does an investor show up and be like, huh, you told me we were going to have, you know, I was going to be the X, Y, Z of an airline. And instead what you're doing is telling me you need another $10 million to get some extra paperwork rebuilt or something yeah. like that. Yeah. yeah. Um, maybe it works. Maybe it doesn't, but hey, you know, it's, it's, it's literally, not, it's literally a question of the runway. How much runway do they have? Yeah. And that's the front of Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's talk about Qantas. They settled with regulators. Uh, they they oversold a bunch of flights that were actually already canceled. Uh, well, it's not that they oversold them. They were selling them at all. Basically, this is in the air post-COVID recovery era. They, oh, yeah. They filed all their flights and they were selling them, but internally knew that they weren't going to be able to operate the full schedule. Yep. And so they internally started canceling off some flights, but not telling anybody who was already booked and still selling seats on them. And it turns out that that's bad. Wow. Shocking. So how, how did they settle? How much did they settle for? Uh, the total was 120 Australian do- million Australian dollars. So I think it's about two thirds of that, about 80 million US is the settlement. A um, hundred Australian dollars, hundred million of it goes to uh, regulate the regulators. So the government is a fine. And the other 20 million goes to the passengers who were booked on these flights. Then they get like 225 for domestic and 450 for international per ticket. Yeah. Over and above all of the refunds and other compensation they already received, it's almost seems fair. Yeah, kind of, kind of does, I guess. Yeah. Um, Emirates. Wait, actually, I would, I would add, how many of the people took refunds and not rebooked? Oh, that's a good point. I don't know, but, but yes, that is the thing. If you take, you might have taken a refund and still gotten paid out. Right. But yeah. if you like, the question is, if it's re, if people just rebooked, right? So, what was the total value of those tickets that were that remained, right? Because that'll determine how much of an impact this really has. If, if the payout's eighty million in the U.S. and they actually made a hundred million in ticket sales on yeah. those ticket sales, they still come out ahead. Like, did yeah. they really get? Did they really get dinged? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, Emirates announced their A three hundred and fifty routes, uh, and there's quite a few of them. I didn't. I forgot that they were getting A three hundred and fifties. To be honest with you, so. <laughs> well, they'll get theirs before United. <laughs> That's fair enough. Thoughts. Fair enough. I mean, who won't get theirs before? <laughs> No, no, United said they're going to take delivery early next decade. Next decade. No, it's great. Okay, there'll be a new A3, you know, Airbus long haul play by then. Um, maybe. Uh, probably in a single aisle, at least. Uh, so, yeah, uh, it's a three classes of service. No first class, but business premium economy and economy. Um, first flight will be on September 15th. Okay. Once daily to Bahrain. So short haul flight. Uh the following day, they'll add a Kuwait turn in as well. So you can imagine doing that with one frame. You can do both of those, you know, a morning turn to Kuwait and an afternoon turn to Bahrain. Uh, they add, and then you know, additional planes will continue to be delivered through the end of the year. I think they're supposed to have 10 by the end of the year. So they add Mumbai and Ahmedabad on October 27th, which is the start of the winter IATA season. Uh, November 1st, the second daily service to Bahrain gets added in. Uh, and then November 4th, Edinburgh comes back. Uh, that service has been suspended for a while. So it, when it gets reinaugurated, it will be on the A350. Muscat and Lyon, France, and Bologna, Italy on December 1st. And oh, and Colombo, Sri Lanka on January 1st of 2025. So these are these are clearly routes that they don't think need first class. Yeah. And a lot of them are shorter. Like yeah. the Middle East stuff, right? Those are all really short. Lyon and uh, Bologna, longer, but not super long. Also kind of like third tier, or not third tier, I guess second tier European cities are not main attractions uh, in France and Italy. So I guess that kind of makes sense. Isn't it Edinburgh? Edinburgh? 
Yeah, uh, that's the thing. I, I like Edinburgh's been an A380 at times, right? Is, isn't Edinburgh been the A380? Or is it Man? Maybe it's Manchester. Yeah, it's Manchester. yeah. I mean, I think it's this is probably a familiarity flights is what's happening, which is why it sees weird routes. Yeah, but, right. it, but then, but then you have like India, right, and Pakistan. Yeah, but India and Pakistan, you don't have to worry about quality. But is but isn't it? Wouldn't you want? I mean, they've got heavy like. Like to Mumbai, I would think they would want an A380 as much as they can. But they uh, it, are they passenger have, restricted? They're ca- they're passenger restricted on the bilateral there. Gotcha. So they they, I mean, it, it, you're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. I guess you put the cheaper plane, like the one that costs less to operate, on the route, and carry a decent number. I don't know. It's it's a strange thing. Yeah. And then Colombo, are they restricted on Colombo? Because at a time, I thought that was an A380 as well. I don't fun. think so, but it's uh, they've got four daily flights there. Hey, then that's yeah. Uh, Edinburgh has always been a seven seven W for 2019, 2020, 2021. And I searched for starting in twenty fifteen. So yep. Um, I'm gonna call it Columbo and see what I get. I'm look. I'm looking right now too. It's been a seven seven W as well, for the most part. Almost almost has done seven seven two, seven seven three, seven seven W. They did a uh, three three eighty for a one day special back in twenty eighteen. Oh, okay. And then they and then they also operate that with Fly Dubai, yes. It's kind of it's wild, um, yeah, yeah. Three hundred and eighty only did a one off. I when I did the Colombo flight, my first class ad- adventure, that was also just a seven seven W. Gotcha. Interesting stuff. Um, and this is, I mean, they get them in September, so they're getting their first day three fifty pretty quickly, like pretty soon. Soon, yeah, yeah. They were a little while back, but yeah, yeah. Uh, what else? Spirit. They, uh, had their, yeah, they had their earnings call and they lost about 147 million. And uh, yeah, it's not um, good. No, and it, what was interesting to me, uh, mixed in with all the other conversation on the call, and I was only half listening to it, but you know, so maybe there was more important things said. But they mentioned a couple times talking uh, things about the onboard product. At one point, there was a comment that I think Ted Christie, the CEO, said something to the effect of in the 2010s, we were financially hyper successful. But that came at the expense of giving passengers a product that was pretty terrible. And I'm mildly paraphrasing. He didn't say the product's terrible. but um, And we don't think that's the way to get back to the profits again. So we're going to have to pivot with our onboard product. And that sentiment was repeated a couple times. I'm waiting for the transcript to come up to look at it because, again, I didn't listen to the whole thing very well. But that sounds to me a little like Southwest's comments last week about we might need to do something about seating on board. And I don't know what the hell either of them are going to do. Yeah, but I mean, what can, I mean, Spirit Spirit's already got big print deep. Yeah, exactly. And so I, I don't, maybe they're just saying their product in general isn't great. Like, wait, I don't, I, I, they, I, they, I, they need to be told that? Or maybe they, they just need to do acknowledge it. I don't know. It's weird. It's weird, it's what weird you do it, right? Like, they're not going to, are they going to take a row out and put more leg room in? Are they going to add padding to the seats? Are they going to, Give, a, give you an actual tray table, in. yeah, a real a real tray table. Like I, I don't know. So so interesting. Yeah, uh, hard to hard to know where the where the options you know play out here. But I I think if you're if you're spirit right, you're looking for ways to generate revenue, and the jet blue thing falling through has been, I, I think a, a maybe a distraction from that for yeah. for some time, but. I, I don't. I don't know that improving the product is your pro- your problem. Like maybe you're you need to make it so that you're more consistently on time and you get more repeat customers. I mean, sure they have this data. Um, I don't know. So anyway, I mean the product probably ha- does play into it, right? right? Like there's a perception of the market on spirit. So that, that you're going to be assaulted. I mean, like, yeah, I mean, <laughs> <you're crazy. laughs> if spirit wasn't on TMZ every other day, it might help. That's true. Seth doesn't like these comments because he flies Spirit. Eh, not as much anymore. They pulled out of uh, Manchester, and I no longer have gold status. So, oh, gotcha. But like, it, it's an interesting. One. I was looking for tickets from Newark to Kansas City, and Spirit will let you buy a ticket from Newark to Kansas City via Las Vegas. Well, that seems like a money maker. Like, how does it seem to make sense? Yeah. Uh, why not? Hey, they are adding the route, right? They're pulling. They are adding that route because JetBlue pulled out. Okay. So they are riding a nonstop, and so it may just be day of week or which day they're getting it and they're trying to sell it. But if you can sell that ticket, you know, again, pricing-wise, whatever, but if you can sell that ticket and get grab the 
bag fee and or the carry on fee for the multiple segments and the seat assignment fee for the multiple segments. That's not a terrible plan. But Chuck Blue never flew Newark to Kansas City. They flew JFK to it. And Newark is not JFK, as we know. Thanks, Fiorello. Um, <laughs> huh. This is bizarre. Some completely different. Surf Air. Remember the, uh, they were the West Coast, like, pseudo private ones, right? I don't remember. Right? I don't know that name, actually. Were they like the early, early club membership? No, never heard of them. Um, yeah, they were like the early, yeah, in California and Texas. They were the ones you bought in and you get, you bought a club of like unlimited flights on the routes that they operated. Uh, oh, yeah, I, I kind of uh, remember this. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it was uh, intrastate, so it didn't have quite the same level of regulation uh, for at least when it started, if I remember correctly. Anyway, Southern Airways Express gets that and is going to start using that name now. And Surf Air is going to change its name to Surf Anywhere. This is weird. Sorry, this came in while we were. I just, I mean, I think, I think Spirit needs to focus. That's my, that's my, that's my takeaway. Yeah. Well, the the other thing about their earnings statement that leaves me concerned for their future is the con- they kept talking about in the financial stuff. They basically said uh, international is where the bottom fell out revenue wise. Uh and there's a lot of, right, this is one of those airplanes are easy to move around. Frontier showed up, uh, some of the other airlines showed up and like started dumping a ton of capacity into Latin America and that market softened. Spirit did not make as much money. But then they also started talking about like competition in North America and weather issues and ATC issues. And they're like, none of that changed your revenue, guys. That yeah. may have changed your costs a little bit, but none of that changed your revenue. And your revenue was down and that's bad news. Yeah. Revenue was down year over year. Yeah, they need to, they need to, they need to kind of get everybody's heads together, and start thinking about how do we how do we generate revenue, how do we generate it consistently over time, and then come up with a plan on how to implement this. Because I, I don't think I don't think it's necessarily a product problem. Maybe it is. Maybe people are just you know fed up with it. But they have Wi Fi on board now and stuff like these seem like easy revenue wins. When I mean, I, I don't think people are. Yeah, and they do want to a lot for Wi Fi. The price has gone up significantly. But oh, is it? So I don't know if that's the answer. Yeah. I mean, I could think the question I would ask is, I presume that most market spirits, in, they're the ones setting the prices. So why don't mm-hmm. they raise prices? Yeah. Because as long I, as they're cheaper than the regular carrier, who cares, right? And the regulars are, are going to undercut them generally. They'll match them at this point. Yeah. What were you going to say, Seth? No, I was going to say on the uh, setting prices thing, yes and no. They do in some markets, but you know, if Frontier shows up, they don't necessarily. How, has Frontier had their call yet? Uh, yes, this was last week. And how are they doing in comparison? Uh, they didn't lose as much money as everybody expected them to, but it was mostly because they booked very strong numbers on their fleet through sale leaseback transactions. Huh. So basically saying that they, because they signed a deal, I think it was in 2017 or 2019, they yep. signed the deal for like a huge number of A321neos. Uh, they buy, they're buying them outright and then selling them back to lessors and leasing them and taking a uh, capital gain on the transaction. Gotcha. Yeah. Not good. Not good. Yeah. Uh, speaking of Frontier, uh, they apparently are going to add Frontera as a brand name. Yeah. It was registered with the DOT, published, we're recording this on Monday. It was, the, it was approved on Monday. This is, this hurts no me. word on what the hell's going on there. Are they going to add a Frontera grill in the back of the plane? Like, I don't, what? Yeah, Jason made the same comment. As long as they're serving tortoise, he doesn't care what they call it. Um, yeah, you, you can call it, we fly. I don't know, whatever. It, no. <sighs> yeah. It's, it's uh, bad. It's bad. Uh, well, anything else? The only thing I could think of is like, are they going to try a branded Mexican service or something like that? Right? Like, yeah. You go, go with the Spanish ish, um, whatever. I mean, that's, that's a good point. Like, is this going to be like their Spanish? focused carrier like low cost that they you know this is how they they use this brand when marketing to latin and central america and do you use that to compete against the theoretical eventual maybe allegiant and vivo airbus tie up yeah we're gonna do the airline with an airline again i think ted is back (laughs) do you say they are oh god uh anything else you guys want to talk about before we jump to the bonus topics no well, for our Patreon subscribers, you're going to get to talk about, uh, we're going to talk about uh, United's app update, Boeing locked out its firefighters, uh, a, a $50 million push for more channel traffic, Bermuda Air, some more stuff from Southwest, uh, and uh, some 
some uh, theoretical what Southwest should do to, to fix their Max 7 problem. So stick around for that if you're a Patreon subscriber. If not, thanks for listening, and we will talk to you next time. Happy travels. See you later.